Well, this is uh, very interesting, and, and I think what you're going to get today is the whole spectrum from what we would call boutique um, to uh, mass production specialty oil. We're, we're on the other end of the, of the scale there. Uh, we crush 350,000 tons of canola a year, and uh, the oil that we're going to ship out is mostly going to go by rail car. So, uh, Okay, well, again, what we're seeing here today is, is, a, is the best example I've seen in a long time of the fragmentation of the food industry. What's happening is, is that food is becoming a lifestyle choice in this country, and the number of permutations that you can get on any kind of food nowadays is, is mind-boggling. Uh, so we have, you know, unrefined oils from several different oil seeds and uh, all the way up to uh, organic. Um, if you go to the grocery store, a, a PCC or a, a Whole Foods, um, if you go to the potato chip aisle, you'll see small bags of chips and if you look closely, you'll see a little green symbol on some of those bags that will say non-GMO certified. And so uh, one of uh, uh, the, the uh, products I'm going to talk about today is non-GMO. Uh, but again, we're, we're at a, a little different scale than what we've heard up till this point. So um, uh, we, are, uh, we are an expeller press plant, so we do not use hexane. But other than the non-hexane, we, we make oil that you would go buy right off the grocery shelf in a, in a bottle, and it would be pretty much indistinguishable from any other mass-produced canola oil that you would buy. The, uh, the fact that we don't use hexane so that we're just a mechanical process is really the gateway into these specialty oils. Because if you're a consumer and you're looking for a non-GMO product, you really don't want non-GMO oil that was made from something that's too carbon short of gasoline. So, uh, so the mechanical extraction is really sort of the first step and it opens up the doors then to for uh, 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 non-GMO, uh, high oleic non-GMO, uh, Diet Coke, Diet Cherry Coke, uh, caffeine-free Diet Coke, the whole, the whole gamut. And, um, and so basically we've, we, uh, we are going to focus on that end of the market as best we can. Even as we do that uh, for the foreseeable future, still the majority of our crush and our sales will be uh, uh, typical mass-produced canola oil made from gen uh, genetically modified canola. So it's still going to be well over half of our total production. But as we move forward, we hope to capture more and more of that specialty market. Um, so the non-GMO is just simply uh, conventionally bred uh, canola varieties that have not had a gene inserted that uh, gives them an herbicide tolerance. Um, there is a little bit of potential confusion with Clearfield varieties. Uh, Clearfield uh, types do have herbicide tolerance, but they are not genetically mo modified. They were conventionally bred. So Clearfield varieties do qualify as non-GMO. Um, there's a class of oils now uh, that is primarily going to food processors, uh, pe people like potato chip manufacturers that's high oleic. This particular kind of oil has a, a higher smoke point. It does not degrade as fast in the process, and so uh, they can cook their potato chips at a higher temperature, use the oil longer. It has more value to them. And so uh, the most common uh, type of variety is called an Xera. That's a Dow patented uh, uh, type of canola. And, um, um, and that does carry a premium. I'm not going to dwell too much on that, but uh, that, is a, that is one type of uh, material that we're going to be doing here in the future. Then we have high oleic non-GMO. That is a segment that we're going to go after, and that is people like these potato chip guys that have that little symbol uh, on their package. And non-GMO high oleic is very hard to come by, and we've had a lot of response from the marketplace telling us they would like to have that product if we could provide it. And then we get all the way to organic, um, and uh, that's a little ways off, but eventually we would like to uh, uh, be doing organic as well. We may, uh, we may go into cooperation with regional crushers to crush it, where then we could refine the oil and the regional crusher would then sell the meal. Our plant is so big that frankly we can segregate the oil and I think we can meet the organic certification just fine. 
but it's going to be very hard for us to segregate that meal and uh, and keep it uh, purely organic uh, qualified. Um, each of these types has to be identity preserved, and in the case of non-GMO, um, it's not quite as stringent as organic, but it's close. It has to be 99.1% pure, and there is a, a, a PCR test that actually uh, tests for the genetically modified proteins that would be in that oil. You have to test the crude oil. So that is a product that has to be uh, uh, kept identity preserved very carefully through the whole process. Okay, we will assist with obtaining seed. Um, we're we're going to try to segregate it into certain elevators and varieties. Obviously, growers who have farm storage have a leg up, uh, but we're going to work with those growers carefully to make sure that their facilities are clean and that they can do the identity preservation. Um, Non-GMO varieties are going to require different weed regimes. Uh, so conventional varieties, there are good herbicides. Uh, uh, registered for them. Uh, Frank Young has done a lot of research on that. Depending on your wheat problems, uh, hopefully a non-GMO won't be too big of an issue. Now here's something you probably haven't heard before, but uh, we are going to pay growers a premium to grow, this is winter canola now, on winter canola we're going to pay growers a premium to grow the highest yielding varieties. Uh, as it turns out, the highest yielding varieties in winter canola are conventional. And uh, that's for a couple of reasons. Jack Brown's varieties were bred to be here, uh, bred to grow here, I should say. But the other thing is, is that any time you introduce a gene for herbicide tolerance, you're going to get a yield drag. And if, you're, if you've got a conventional variety, you don't have that yield drag. So uh, consequently, the, uh, the, the conventional varieties tend to be the highest yielding. We will pay a significant premium for them. I'm going to throw out a number uh, of around $20 a ton, but it may take uh, it, uh, the form of different uh, uh, incentives that we would do, for example, uh, perhaps a, a transportation allowance to take it to an elevator that might be a little further away that could uh, store it separately, or these kinds of things. But it'll be a significant uh, premium. Um, and so depending on the type of canola, for example, this high Lake Nexera that I mentioned, those varieties do have a yield hit. And so in, in many cases, the premiums for those varieties can run $40 a ton or higher. So uh, it really depends on the specific type. And we're going to be working with elevators in the four western states, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana, to contract these varieties, keep them separate so that we can process them. Okay, so our immediate focus is non-GMO. Uh, uh, best examples we, we have of that are Jack Brown's varieties at U of I, uh, Amanda and Athena. Uh, we have some other, uh, some DLC varieties that have performed very well. We have Clearfield Spring varieties. This year we are going to be promoting Clearfield Spring canola to the best of our ability. We'll be offering contracts for that with a premium. Um, uh, as far as I know, I don't think there are any Clearfield winter varieties, so all the Clearfield is spring. Um, and then any European spring variety, they don't allow genetically modified canola in uh, Europe, so any European spring variety is going to be a conventional variety. Um, any producer who, uh, uh, or elevator for that matter, that's interested in working with their producers, that uh, wants to handle uh, non-GMO or is putting out clear field seed, we're encouraging you to contact us and let's work together to keep that seed separate and, uh, and pay a premium to the grower. And we also understand that the elevators uh, are going to be doing a little more work and there's frankly more money in it for the elevators as well. It's just a, a value-added product throughout the whole system. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, to the best of our ability, help out with transportation and storage requirements to help keep this separate. The uh, primary uh, high Lake type is Dexera. That is controlled by Dow. We are going to uh, begin agronomic testing of some of the Dow varieties this year. Those are all springs. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we're going to see how they do as we go along. Then we will uh, expand the acreage of high Lake. Um, we want to expand the non-GMO production of canola in the West, and I should say uh, our primary mission, even above that, is to simply expand canola production in the West. We would like to see 
uh, 350 to 400,000 acres in the four western states in a short period of time as we can make that happen. Uh, so we're going to be very, very aggressive in, in working with the entire industry uh, throughout the whole uh, supply chain to, uh, to increase canola acreage in, uh, in the four western states. But non-GMO is going to be a particular focus for us. Um, we're, we're looking at limited organic production for 2013, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, we hope to kind of test the system. Uh, basically, our organic customers, both in meal and oil, have said uh, they, uh, they can't imagine us producing more than they can take. In fact, the organic meal market for canola is, is really huge. You can't hardly walk into a, a, a say, a chain or full service grocery store anymore without seeing organic milk in the, uh, in the case. And that organic milk has to be uh, made with organic feed. And uh, high fat canola meal, which is what we produce, is one of the most desired uh, dairy feeds there is. And so it's a very, very valuable product and there's a huge demand for it. Um, here again, I just want to emphasize, I don't want to give any of the, anybody the impression that we're not going to buy your Roundup Ready or your Liberty Link canola, we are in the market for that, and, uh, and so uh, as we go along, we hope that uh, depending on you know, the weed situation and the particular rotation and growing regime that a grower has, that, uh, that they could rotate a, a conventional canola along with their uh, herbicide tolerant canolas, and it's just really, it's a case-by-case -case basis, but we're going to encourage people to do that the best we can. Well, that's, uh, that's about it.